Welcome to Becoming Divine. My name is Julia Wesley. I'm a professional intuitive. And today I have Paul Sterling with us. He is an international speaker on love and relationships and sought after couples coach. And he's also the best selling author of Are You Less, Love More. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm excited about the topic. Uh, and what they say is, is every master started out as a disaster. So I, um, what I want to do is give people hope that if I can learn these things, anybody can, because I grew up, I grew up with an older brother that was like the James Dean, sort of the master of relationships and women were lined up to go out with him. And I had what I call relationship repellent. Like I, could, I don't know if you can relate to that. So everything I'm talking about is a learned skill on okay. top of being a relationship disaster. That's good. That's good. To know. It's hope for everyone. You know, we don't just have to be born with this, you know? Exactly. And I went through one divorce and four broken engagements. So I learned the tough way. Yeah. And then I stumbled across people, you know, along the path. And it wasn't a straight line, but people like Tony Robbins. And I ended up uh, being on his support staff and then working for him. So Tony was my boss. And then I went on and did other things. And then Tony hired me to come back in and, and uh, teach his inner circle. So Tony Robbins was, I went from introducing Tony to Tony introducing me. And it was like that, <laughs> I, that was a day I was, <laughs> I was starstruck. I was sitting on the back bench where somebody was introducing him and he's talking to me and I'm sort of going like, life has changed here. <laughs> so that's great. I, and, and I, I, there's a lot of different things I could do with my life, but for some reason I am obsessed, mm -hmm. whether that's healthy or not, with the idea of what's it take to make relationships work? Yeah. And, and why don't they? What gets in the way of making a healthy, happy, harmonious relationship? Because almost everybody wants that. And then they get in a relationship and, and they get stuck on this question, can I be me and still be in a relationship? with you. And so I want to just show people a little bit of this model and have you ask all the questions here. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to walk through this. And, and Perfect. what I think almost everybody wants is, is right here. We all want a relationship that keeps getting better and better. And so some of the things I'm going to tell you about today, Julia, are simple, not easy. Okay, good. And yeah. what makes a relationship better and better is a state of, uh, of gratitude. You're grateful, you know? So like in the beginning of a relationship, your partner brings you home a rock and you're like, oh my God, he brought <laughs> me a rock or she brought me this. It's like, you know, and it's, it's easy to win, hard to lose. That, that makes sense. You know, you do a little thing, yeah. you do the dishes, you make a meal, and, and they're happy. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm talking about on both sides. It's, this is not, this is not something for men or women. This is for both people or gay, straight, whatever the relationship is being in a state of gratitude. Now I've worked with couples that that starts to die in a, in a couple of weeks. And I've worked with couples where they're together 30 and 40 years. In fact, one, one couple just read my book and loved it. And they've been together over 50 years. They're in a state of gratitude yeah. and they love the differences. Yeah. Now here's where it starts to turn to crap or whatever. You know, I got a, I, I have my background ex commercial fisherman. So my language, you know, <laughs> you'll have to tell me if we're, <laughs> no, it, we're very grounded around here. We can, we can use what language comes naturally to us. Okay, so here's where the relationship starts to turn to crap, uh -huh. is when we take each other for granted, and it starts to become easy to lose. You bring home the rock, and it's like, what do you mean? It's not a diamond. It's like, you know, it's mm -hmm. not good enough, and it becomes really hard to win. Yeah. And what I want to talk about a tiny bit, masculine and feminine minds are wired differently. Over thousands of years, we've been wired differently, and and that's changing that we're in the we're in the place where 
evolution. We're not growing a third arm or something like that. Mm -hmm. The evolution is an internal evolution versus a physiological evolution. We're evolving to how to survive in, in the new world and relationships yeah. are changing. And so we're, we're dealing, we've got like the old model of masculine and feminine or men and women, and that's changing. Yes. I, women. yeah. Can I, can I interject? Can I ask a question yes. or at least make a comment? So when you were talking about gratitude, um, it's funny, I'm starting a gratitude practice. I'm reading this book, we're doing exercises. And it's funny when you mentioned the rock, one of the practices is literally a gratitude rock you hold on to the rock and you think about the best thing that happened during your day. And today is the day where you focus on three things about uh, three people that you want to have a better relationship with. And then you just repeat it throughout the day. So I just think that in my world is called synchronicity. <laughs> that's, that's so perfect. And, and here's the simple thing. It, it, I'm going to tie right back to what you were saying. If the quality of your if the quality of your life is based on the quality of your relationships, mm -hmm. the quality of your relationships is based on the quality of your communication. When your communication falls apart, so does your relationship. So that was a lot. People may want to repeat that, hear that again. <laughs> quality of relationships, quali quality of life, quality of relationships, quality of relationships, quality of communication. When communication falls apart, so does your relationship. Now, the thing that's going to tie into what you were saying is that if you want to be successful, you learn how to talk to other people. If you want to be happy, you learn how to talk to yourself. And the thing that most of us don't do that you're teaching right now, I think, is also to be grateful for ourselves, not just to be grateful for everybody else, but why am I glad that I'm me? Yeah. What am I proud of? How am I excited about my life? Yes. versus oh my god why didn't I, why wasn't i born like them yes. why don't i look like them or have their money so it's like one of the best relationships we can have is one for ourselves and are we grateful for ourselves or are we taking ourselves for granted bingo yeah so i love that that ties totally into what you're teaching and it's the micro and the macro Yes. So down here, and we're going to dive into a little more, but is something called the P-O-N-R. Do you know what that stands for? No. Point of no return. Ah, okay. So certain, if we don't handle these issues, we end up at the point of no return. So this is what relationships look like. We have five different zones. And right now it's uh, about... 55 to 65 percent divorce rate and relationship failures way more than that that's just divorce rate <laughs> so here are the five phases and then we're going to dive into the model but i just want people to see this relationships can be in crisis crisis this should be conflict conflict stuck in a rut good great now if you think about it julia are 55% of the people in great relationships getting a divorce? No, probably not. In good relationships. Doesn't, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like down here, it's people who are in crisis. It's more yeah. like 80% of those. And I don't, I, I think it's probably not even 5% of the people in great. So if you want your relationship to last, mm -hmm. it's moving it over here. Yes. That's how you make bulletproof relationships, whether bulletproof, probably not the right term, but it's, it's, it makes sense. It's not just finding the right person. It's the care and feeding of the relationship. How do you nurture yourself mm -hmm. in it? Cause that's a, can I be me? And how do you nurture the relationship? So that makes sense. Absolutely. And there's different things to do in each of these phases to get from here to here, to here, to here, to here. So if you're down here, this is crisis is ER. You're headed for the emergency room. You need a coach. You need someone to kind of intervene and yeah. stop the bleeding. <laughs> so let's look at here's, here's 
the model and I'm, I'm showing a lot at once here. So let's isolate it a little bit. Okay. And slow me down if you need to. This line right here is at the bottom. I'm sacrificing myself up here. I'm being myself. Okay. Over here, I'm disconnected. And that can be disconnected from myself or disconnected from you. I'm mm -hmm. over here. I'm connected. So let's take a look and I'm going to blow this up right here. Okay. This first corner is where I'm disconnected and I'm sacrificing myself and I'm in a fear-based relationship. Yes. And I can, I, I'm going to tell you the story I told before. I, I traveled around the world as a business consultant. And what that typically means is I was an international problem solver. When a government or a business couldn't solve their problem internally, they would bring me in. And so typically it had to be a big problem because people don't want to bring in somebody outside to solve problems. Uh -huh. Anyway, the city of Albuquerque brought me in. I was working with their different departments. Most of their top management went through my course on quality, productivity, and leadership. Now, that gave me a way of thinking about relationships that's different than most people. I look at the underlying system, not the symptoms. Does that make sense? I actually love that because when you focus on the system, it sort of removes uh, your identification with the problem. Like you're not the problem. It's what are we doing? What's the system? Is the system breaking down? And I think yes. that makes it easier to work with. Yeah, because when I work with a couple and I work with couples from, I, I've got couples from England and India and uh, Australia and around the world, we work on, on uh, over Zoom. And what we're doing is they typically come in trying to figure out who is the problem. Like I'm just with, I'm here with them. Yeah. They're the problem. <laughs> and if you could fix them, I'm just here to make sure they show up. Right. And we go from who is the problem to what is the problem? Yeah. And how are we communicating? That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't agree on the problem, you won't agree on the solution. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And getting clear what the problem is, is so important. Because if you look at it, it's a difference between Eastern medicine and Western medicine. If I have cancer, and they cut it out, that's the, the cutting it out is dealing with the symptom. And that's that could be really important. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't do that, but also work on the system. What was my thinking? What was my eating? What were my habits? What was the environment that allowed cancer to show up? Yes. So that's the system. So work yeah. on both of them. Yeah. So here we go. I was talking to, I interviewed everybody. I interviewed somebody at the parks department and he said, I worked really hard and nobody noticed. Mm -hmm. And it was really depressing. And then for two more weeks, I did nothing, nothing, no work, and nobody noticed. So basically what he had done is he had quit. Now, there's plenty of people that have been in relationships 10, 20, 30 years, but they basically have quit. They're not really in a relationship. They're sort of reluctant roommates that just haven't moved out yet. Mm -hmm. The relationship is dead. It just hasn't been buried. And so... That's the quit and stay. It's all about loss. I'm sacrificing myself. I'm being a martyr, but I'm disconnected to you. You're disconnected to me. It's all about loss. So yeah. the listeners can think, where are they? And by the way, I've been in all of these. So I, my, you know, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody else. I'm pointing it right here. Like <laughs> this has been my life. And I, um, I looked at that. And I went, wow, that was awful. Because I'm and part of me when to quit and stay was like, oh, they're so good and I'm so bad and I'll never find somebody as good as them again. And, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. And can I say that the, um, the I have given up on ever getting my needs met, I've dealt with depression and anxiety. That reminds me of the state I was in when I was in the depression loop. Yeah. Like if we're talking about a relationship with ourselves. Yeah. That relationship with ourselves. And, and the other thing, is that we 
we have a, a, a nation of needs shame. We're told not to have needs. And um, it's like we have three different relationships with needs. Needs shame, needs embarrassment, and needs embrace. So needs shame is there's something wrong with me. If I didn't have my needs, and men have been taught a lot of needs shame around their desire for sex and intimacy. For fit, like, oh, you're being a dog, you're being like, there's a lot of need shame put on men for having those desires. There's a lot of need shame for women around being emotional, having emotion. Oh, it's just that time of month, you know, it's like all of these different like things that we have in the culture yeah. that create shame. So the shame, if I'm broken, there's something wrong with me for having needs, needs embarrassment which is, I want you to read my mind, meet my needs, but I don't want to have to ask you. And if you don't, if I have to ask you, that you don't love me anymore. There's something wrong with us. <laughs> and the problem with in the beginning of a relationship, you do everything, you bring them rocks and flowers, and you touch them, you know, the five love languages, touch, talk, time, acts of service, gifts, um, and I don't know how to turn my notices off. Sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> ah! uh, and now, and now I have it, it, shame. <laughs> I'm broken here. So it's like looking at in the beginning of a relationship, your partner is doing everything. And then as the relationship matures, they pull back to their love strategy. And it may okay. be different than yours. And you're going, what happened? They don't love me anymore. No, they still love you. They're showing love in a way that doesn't match your strategy. Okay. And if you're, if you're embarrassed about asking for it, going, honey, it's great that you buy me stuff, but I'm not that interested. I really need touch mm -hmm. or I need talk or I need to spend time with you. What I need gifts. Well, I might need gifts, acts of service. And it's like knowing you start to know yourself and then you can ask for what you want. Yes. Now we move up to the next one, which is where you're being yourself, but you're disconnected at some levels from your partner. And it ends up being all about me. And this is sort of the everyone for themselves zone. Gotcha. And, and I'll take care of my needs. You take care of your needs. We'll be in a relationship, but more like roommates. Mm -hmm. And I worked with one couple that had been together for, well, they've been living in the same house for seven or eight years, sleeping in separate bedrooms, not having sex. And they were doing it for the kids, for the kid, actually, one child, one, their daughter. Yeah. And it's, they, I'm taking care of my needs, you're taking care of your needs. We're coming together just for the kid, but it really was only marginally meeting their needs because their needs for intimacy and connection and partnership weren't being met at all. Yeah. So this is sort of the, this is the world of roommates. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're going to move over here to, to all about you. I've gone from all about me to all about you. This is where I'm sacrificing myself but connected to you. This is also the world of like codependence. Now, if you think about it, our relationships have been transforming radically over the last, you go back three generations. And if you describe what was important in a relationship three generations ago, well, she knows how to cook. She knows how to do laundry. Um, you know, she'd be good childbearing. Now you yes. talk to a woman on your first date and ask her about childbearing and childbearing <laughs> right now, it will probably be the last date too. Yes, you're in trouble. <laughs> but that, and, and women were taught about sacrificing themselves for the family, for your man, for that. Mm -hmm. But men were also taught, sacrifice your life, get a job that sucks your life out of you and yeah. do that job for 30 or 40 years and get a, a watch. So we were, yeah. we were taught all about sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to be clear that in relationships, there still is times that we sacrifice for each other. And it's not a bad thing. But mm -hmm. it's when you give up your life for somebody else and hope that one day it will be your turn. Yeah. 
would you say this would be kind of like the martyr type of zone? Totally the martyr zone. Okay. And what happens in the martyr zone is, is you end up with RRR. So there's two different things, CCC and RRR. RRR is resistance, um, resentment, and regret. Yeah. And that's the life of the martyr. Yep. I'm going to sacrifice now, but you're going to pay. <laughs> there's not going to, there's not going to be any sex. There's not going to be yeah. any, like, I am, I am going to, I'm going to be shut down mm -hmm. intimately, but you'll get what you supposedly need, or you'll yeah. get, you'll get, um, martyr sex, which is duty and obligation, but I won't actually be present. Yeah. My body will be there, but my heart and soul won't. Mm -hmm. And the CCC is what we want. We want connection we want compassion we want cooperation we want to create a level of partnership and and mm -hmm. that's where we end up up here where i'm being myself and i'm connected to you and you're being yourself and connected to me and this is where we treat each other's needs as precious like at the other side we're treating our needs as a burden Yes. And I'm treating your needs as a burden. And this tends to be a, if m men tend to have a harder time having needs, like talking about their needs mm -hmm. and being able to hear a woman's needs without hearing it as a demand and a burden. You're so needy, <laughs> you know? And what I say, to, I had one of my friends who I had been to Alaska with, he was my business partner for years. And I asked him, how's your relationship? He said, oh, I, I, I had to let her go. She was so needy. And I laughed. I said, oh, in other words, her needs got in the way of your needs and you didn't know how to get both sets of needs met. So you prioritized yours and got rid of her. Mm -hmm. And so it's learning how to be with our needs and trust ourselves. So I just say one other thing about trust here is that in a relationship, we normally think about trust this way. It's like, can I trust you? Will you keep your word? Will you keep, will you respect my boundaries? Will you have my back? Will you try to meet my needs when you can? Yeah. So that's that external trust. And that one's easy to see. The one that's hard to see is, can I trust me? in a relationship with you? Do I give up on my needs? Mm -hmm. Do I break my word with myself? Do I have my back? Am, you know, do I treat myself as precious? Or do I think you're the you're the prize? And I'm the problem? Yeah, I think um, in my community, that is something that people struggle with a lot. And they have a tendency to think that this person out there that they're looking for is going to be this magical, magical person. And they don't see themselves as someone who is um, perhaps that magical themselves. And so it's, it's very much focused on how do I get this person? How do I attain this person? How do I find them? And then how do I keep them? Um, and then we completely lose connection with who we are and what we need, you know? Yeah, and, and that we're also the prize. And see, this is where yeah. we're taking ourselves for granted. Yes. What we bring to the relationship and was like, they're this super prize. Yes. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. It's like, if you look at relationships, I didn't think I was going to talk about this, but this will be really quick. There, there's three levels that you are. You're either the catch now in Hollywood, the catch is the cheerleader or the football player or the, you know, someone who's like in the in crowd. Yeah. I'm not talking about that catch. That mm -hmm. catch can be miserable to have. If you actually catch them, it could be like hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about the catch is someone who in that relationship, they bring you up. They see the best in you. They bring the yeah. best out in you and you bring the best out in them. Mm-hmm. So you're either the catch, the compromise, like I wanted that, but I got you. And you always feel like, oh, and I've been yeah. that. Like I was at one point, I was dating this woman. I was engaged to this woman who was like an actress and, you know, in Hollywood and beautiful. And I, and I always felt like the compromise. Oh, that's a terrible feeling. <laughs> 
<laughs> it is. Yeah. And then there's the catastrophe. And the catastrophe is when the relationship ends, you need three years of therapy even to yeah. like yourself again. Yes. Yeah. You know, it could uh -huh. involve abuse, mental, physical, emotional, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. It's like, wow, what did I do to mm -hmm. deserve this? So just a couple of quick other things. You see the FLP in there. So in a relationship, there are three different relationships. So if you're in like a long-term monogamous, even a long-term polyamorous relationship, whatever format, people have three different roles that they play with you. Friend, partner, lover. So friend, it's what a friend is. They got your back. You can, they, they don't judge you. You can talk about anything and everything. Partner is you're on a team. You feel supported. There's common vision, vol common vision, goals, and you're working towards something together. If you if you live in a house together, your partner's in paying the bills, taking care of the house, dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is lover, and when you're in lover, that's romance, intimacy, and intimacy's got emotional, physical, sexual intimacy, are you doing things? The thing that's critical about lover is it needs to be watered regularly. Mm. Friendship, I can I cannot talk to a friend for years Me and too. we get back together, boom. Yeah. So is this all making sense, this picture yeah. here? Very much so. So I wanna give one last picture and then I'm gonna leave it in your hands is like there are seven essential skills so we talked about this i think before we got on and maybe even during this is like there's a hollywood thing of happily ever after or the new age thing of finding my twin flame or finding my soulmate and then it's like winning the relationship lottery yeah. Once I win the lottery, I can stop working on myself. I can I can sit on the couch and eat donuts. And your your obligation is to love me no matter how much I don't love myself. Yes. <laughs> and that doesn't work. Right. Here's what I've found is seven core skills. These are not the only skills, but these are seven core skills. You need to learn. Whoops. I keep getting too many notices. I'm going to have to learn how to turn that off. All right. <laughs> Communication. Learning how to communicate so that both of you feel heard, understood, and valued. Mm -hmm. Learning how to make friends with your needs so you can notice, name, and negotiate needs. And they feel precious. And you feel precious. Because if your needs don't feel precious, you don't feel precious. Yeah. Conflict resolution. Because if you're in a relationship, you're going to have conflict. Wounds and triggers, mm -hmm. we all get wounded. There's betrayals, there's lies, there's cheating, there, you know, and I'm not making any of that okay, but most long-term relationships, you've got to deal with some wounds and we either get bitter or we get better. Yes. And if we don't get better, the relationship keeps getting smaller and smaller and pretty soon it sucks the life out of it. Building trust, we already talked about trust, the three shades of intimacy. Are you, intimacy actually is uncomfortable. Most people say they want intimacy and then run from it. Mm -hmm. So into me, see, I'm allowing you to see my, not only my dreams and my desires, my vulnerabilities, my weaknesses, my fears and doubts. And there's emotional intimacy, physical touch intimacy, and there's sexual intimacy. Last one is dealing with differences. It's a D's, dealing with differences, difficulties, and decisions. And anytime a committed relationship happens, you've got to deal with this. And if you're not good at it, every decision is going to be, or every difficulty is going to be a meltdown, and it's going to rip you apart rather than bringing you together. Yeah. So when I work with couples, I, I take them through. First, they look and go, where are my strengths? What's my, you know, what's my superpower? What's my kryptonite? Is that making sense? Yes. Yeah. Do we, how are we on time? Do you have five more minutes or? Absolutely. 
Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give the big picture. This is, I, I, I was in New York City a couple of years ago and I got on the subway and it's like overwhelming. Uh, there's, I don't know what it is, 472 miles of track and there's, I don't know how many stations. It's just <laughs> overwhelming. Yeah. And the thing is, without a map, it was impossible. With the map, it was complicated but doable. Yeah. So in relationships, relationships are more complicated than we, than we want them to be, but they're simpler than we think they are because nobody's ever given us a map. Mm -hmm. So Julie, I'm going to take you through a map and I, I want you to, like if any place is confusing, slow me down. Okay. So in the center of the map, what we have is people, most people on your call probably want lasting love. And to have lasting love, you need three major components. You need to be available, mentally, physically, emotionally available. Like some people say they're on Tinder or on eHarmony or they're, they say they're available, but they're not really. Yeah. So available. The second thing is you need to be capable. So if I came to you and said, uh, hey, I can tell you need a root canal and I just got the idiot's guide to root canals and I got a drill from Home Depot. What do you say we give it a try? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, you wouldn't trust your teeth with me, but do you trust your heart with somebody? Right. That's not capable of being with your heart. Right. Like they look like I'm handsome or whatever I am, but it doesn't make me a good dentist. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and some people are, are really handsome or beautiful, but they don't, it, they're not capable to be in a relationship. The third part is, I, are you- I interrupt? I just have a question. What exactly would you describe someone as, um, of being capable? Is it so just- Capable? Mm -hmm. That's simple right there the seven skills they okay. they can communicate they yeah. can meet needs like see okay. this is where i have um i definitely got to turn that notice thing <laughs> off but this is where i've broken it down so capable very clear okay. can you resolve conflicts can you heal wounds cuz if you can't heal wounds you're not available mhm mm so you see where my whole thing of being trained for years as a as a problem solver yeah. and looking at the systems. Mm -hmm. So in this, and willing is the last one. And, and willing means, are you willing to be courageous, to be vulnerable, to be compassionate? Okay, here we go. This is like 30 years of research in five minutes. Okay. It's made up of your heart set, which is why you're even in a relationship. You're in a relationship. And I already said this to connect as a friend, a partner, a lover. To, and when you think about it, have you ever been in a relationship, Julie, where you felt like your needs were a burden? Yes. Yeah. And how, how much fun was that relationship? Sucky. Not fun. <laughs> yeah. And so what we want to move if we want to move from burden to precious. Mm -hmm. Second thing is how, like, it's great to say that we want this, but how, and what you need is skill sets. So in your skills, you're either underprepared or well-equipped. Now there, you know, you go to Vogue or Cosmo or all the rest of, they're giving you the skills of how to, how to do this, how to do that. You go on Google and literally I put in Google, I put relationship advice. It was 98,800,000 hits. Yeah. <laughs> there are tons of how to, but I'm going to tell you a different way of looking at the how to. The how to has to do three things. Number one, clear up the past, help you connect and get present, create possibilities for the future. Okay. If you don't know how to clear up the past, the past ends up in the what? In the present. Yeah. And no possibilities for the future. Like, how come my partner won't commit to me? Because right now it looks fucking miserable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's English though. But it's like, so what we want to do is we want to learn how to clear up the past. And by the way, guys, 
here's the best aphrodisiac out there to be able to be with your partner's emotions. When the feminine goes through all sorts of emotions, ups and downs, can you just be with her without trying to fix her? That is the, the greatest aphrodisiac because it's intimacy. And the woman says, if you can be with my emotions, if I can trust you with my emotions, I'll trust you with my body. And if I can't trust you with my emotions, then yeah, you're not gonna trust. So Julia, I'm speaking for you. What does that resonate? Tell me something. Yeah, that makes sense. If I can't, if I, well, if I can't trust you with my emotions, then how can, how can I trust you to be kind with my, with my body, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the third thing, which is the invisible here is the mindset and it's called your ROS, your relationship operating system. And I have a phone here, worn and torn, but it's got 156 apps on it and it's got one operating system. So if I change the operating system, it impacts all the apps. If I change an app, it doesn't do anything to the operating system. Mm -hmm. When we want to make a big change in our relationship, what we want to do is change our beliefs and our operating system is made up of our habits, patterns, and beliefs. And they're set up either to sabotage us or support us. Have you ever seen when somebody's in a relationship and it's going really good, and they just do things and it screw it up. Yep. That's because of some unconscious belief, some old program. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is, I want to sell you a program. Now, here's the program. It was designed about 30 years ago. It was created by a seven-year-old that had their heart broken, and they saw their parents fighting all the time. And it's full of defects, incompatibilities, and viruses. It's going to make all the most important decisions in your life, like who you're going to love and how you're going to love them. How many of these programs do you want and how much do you want to pay for it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people don't know that. And so yeah. it's like learning about your programming and mm -hmm. finding out, is your programming designed to sabotage you or support you? And what I do is I do something called a relationship breakthrough session. And we, we dive in and we look at where you are now, where you want to go, and what's in the way. Are you set up to win or to lose? Are you set up to sabotage or support? Are you underprepared or well-equipped? Mm -hmm. So um, if people want to get a hold of me, that's that's something that's that I do with people and then give them like a... 90 day program to kind of reprogram themselves. Yeah. So there you go, Julia, there's a, the map of relationships. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, so what is uh, great about this is that I do see a whole lot of um, sort of like woo woo characteristics and especially in the mindset, the beliefs, the past, um, if you don't take care of it, it shows up again in the present. That's what we call the, um, obviously, repeating patterns. But sometimes we refer to that as being like sort of stuck in the same timeline, just repeating the same thing over and over again, but just doing it slightly differently. Um, so I, what I love is that it incorporates that aspect of it, but it's so grounded and real that it uh, makes it seem completely achievable and it makes it seem normal, almost. Yeah. And, yeah. I love that. So, and the feminine can relate to it and the masculine can relate to it. Uh-huh, exactly. And what I like about this is that, so they're like, I, for example, am embodying the feminine as we would call it. And you're obviously embodying the masculine or I'm assuming you are. Um, but what's nice is that we each have, it's not necessarily one or the other. From our perspective, it's sort of like a scale, right? And so what's nice is that there, whether or not I'm embodying the feminine, but whether or not I want to admit it, I still have masculine tendencies within me. So having something concrete and firm is nice. The structure, the whatnot, that's nice. So I find this incredibly helpful. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah, and it's not either or. It's like yeah. I have feminine qualities and masculine qualities, and there's something great, like what we're considering more masculine is sort of the hunter-gatherer, single <laughs> focus, like get yeah. shit done. Uh -huh. And that's great for a woman to have that. 
Uh -huh. it's, it's what gets the kids out to school or gets her job done or all the rest of that. And then to be able to see, the important thing is, is having a choice, taking it from the unconscious pattern mm -hmm. to a choice. I'm going to move into my feminine or I'm going to move into my masculine. For me as a, as a relationship coach, it's important for me to have um, connection to the feminine because then I can connect to their feelings and needs and be there for them in a nurturing way and i can also be there in my masculine kick-ass way <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and i speak dude <laughs> that's gotta be helpful that helps them connect i did want to ask you though so we keep talking about needs like what is it that you need and to me it sort of seems like in order for you to know what your needs are you really have to know who you are so do you do you agree with that would you think that's Yes, I'm bringing it back to this screen. Absolutely. And you actually need to know what your needs are, like to have what allows us to have this conversation is distinctions and words and dialogues. And most people, you know, like for men, I need sex and I need food. You know, they, those are the things they're willing to admit that they need. And there, there's a whole list. And I've come up with um, from one of my trainers, Marshall Rosenberg, there was hundreds. From Tony Robbins, there was six. I've come up with like the top 10 needs we have in relationships. And if we get those needs met and can even talk about them, mm -hmm. I'm having the need. Like one of the ones that's embarrassing is, is a need to feel significant and feel like a priority. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's, if you want, and, and, and see if you can get clear on that, it doesn't mean that 24 seven, I'm making you a priority. It means that we have an, a half an hour today. That's our connecting time. And during that half an hour, what can I do that will make you feel like a priority right now? Yeah. Um, and set me up to win. Tell me what you need so I can get it for you. So I can hunt for that result. And so Variety, we need variety, we need significance, we need connection, we need intimacy, those three different shades of intimacy, growth, contribution, um, and go through it and be able to identify it. I've never had anybody come to me and go, oh man, you know, my top 10 needs are all getting met at seven, eight, or nine. I think I'm going to get a divorce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's understanding this and, and building your skills to be able to notice, name, and negotiate your needs yeah. and not feel ashamed of them. So I, I'm wondering on your take on this, I know quite a few men who actually, I don't think prioritize their own needs. Um, I think that they're sort of stuck in the provider kind of paradigm. And I think that they have a hard time feeling good about demanding that their needs be met. Do you well, want yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about language. And as soon as you demand that a need and. get met, you're going to get <laughs> resistance. So it's not about demanding. It's about yeah. making a beautiful request. Mm -hmm. and, and being a provider is one of our needs. It's a need to contribute. So- right. What happens is when, when one need ends up dominating the others at the expense of, if the only way I feel comfortable is by contributing, I end up moving to the martyr zone. Right, okay. And so when I'm asking though, to get a need met, I start to be vulnerable. So receiving yeah. is, uh, is vulnerable and mm -hmm asking to receive is vulnerable. And I've had guys come to me and, you know, they sit on the, <laughs> sit in my office when I had people at my office and say, I would rather jump out of an airplane <laughs> at night into enemy territory where people are trying to kill me. And they, they were being literal here. Yeah. Then I would talk about my feelings and needs. And it's, it, vulnerability, we, we were taught, especially among the masculine, that vulnerability equals weakness. Yes. And vulnerability is one of the most courageous things we can do. That's why it's so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, and you look at the work of Brene Brown, it's just taken yeah. off. 
Yeah. Right? And it's like, she's one of the, when I'm working with a couple, one of the first things I do is have them go watch Brene Brown, go binge watch Brene Brown, and then come back and let's talk about the relationship. Yeah. And let's talk about changing the paradigms of way the ways we interact. So yes. I want to just tell people that are watching this, don't think that because you watched it one time, you actually got it. I would watch this three, four times, watch it with your partner, you know, and get on and, and do what Julie is talking about with the gratitude exercises, join her gratitude system and start being creating a practice of being grateful for yourself and for your partner and vocalize it on a daily basis. Go, honey, what I'm grateful, what I really appreciate about you is, and be specific. Yeah. And so this might be slightly off topic, but what would you recommend for people who are like verbalizing their needs, but they're still not having them met? And maybe it's more like a family relationship than it is sort of like a relationship that you chose. Well, you're, got, you're getting back to the, to a huge chunk and maybe at some other time we'll, we'll dive into it, but it's okay. a communication process. Communication. Okay. And a lot of times what we think is because just because we said it, that the other person agreed to it because they didn't disagree. Okay. So okay. silence doesn't equal agreement. Gotcha. Yeah. And unless you can get a, a relationship where I can be honest, you know, you can say, I want you to take out the trash and I go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you might think because I didn't say no friggin' way yeah. that I actually agreed to it. And then when the trash isn't taken out, then you're like, what's wrong? He said he would. No, he never said he would. Okay. He just didn't say he wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. And then we have an expectation. So it's like we start to have a conversation about how are we making agreements? Yes. And this gets okay. into the whole world of communication. Yeah. So I would say, honey, are you cooking dinner tonight? And will you cook me dinner tonight? So there's okay. a more, it would really meet a need of mine to feel supported. And then you kind of, huh, I go, wow, <laughs> can you tell me what you heard me say? Okay, yeah. Because I'm okay. trying to make sure that the message sent is the message received. Now, okay. when I'm, the, the last part, and this is, we've gone from communication 101 Mm -hmm. to communication 505. Okay. You ready for this? Mass. So nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say what violent communication is, is I want my needs to get met and I don't care whether it meets your needs to do it or not. Okay. Yeah. So I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care whether it meets your needs or not. Take the damn trash out. Right. Or okay. cook the dinner or do the laundry or have sex or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And if I don't care about your feelings and needs, it comes across as a demand or it's, okay. you know, violent to your soul. Mm -hmm. Now, for it to be nonviolent, I need to have you understand my precious need, but I also need to understand yours and find a way that it meets both of our needs. Gotcha. Okay. That's and so great. that's a more complicated conversation and more yeah. in depth. So I need to be understood. I need to understand and then ask for action. That's really interesting because I think before, when I asked the question, I was just focusing on making sure that one person's needs were met, but it also requires, well, what does this other person need and how are they hearing what you're saying? Okay, that makes me way more sense. Like See, that. a dictator, it's like my needs, I don't care about your needs. And if you look at countries, you look at it on the micro and on the macro, it's like, yeah. we're going to meet our needs, the United States needs, and it doesn't matter about all the other countries. Right. Yeah. It's no fun to be in a relationship with a country like that. It's no fun to be in a relationship with a person like that. So true. That makes so much sense. Can I ask, so the, the way that you're speaking about it, when you're talking about nonviolent communication, it, it reminds me a lot of Buddhism. Like I really connect with Buddhism. I wonder if you've ever studied it or if you... Just barely. Really? You know, okay. But if you look at it, 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 you could look at almost every 
religion, religion. yeah you're right it, it's at the heartbeat of almost every caring religion you know and, yeah. and what is what i think the dalai lama said my religion is a religion of kindness yeah. and inclusion mm -hmm. and if you look at it that's what spirituality tends to be and what i see the best of religions is is a religion of kindness and inclusion yeah and so what we want in relationships is a relationship of kindness and inclusion and yeah. taking care of each other's needs and not making demands okay and what happens we tend to make demands if we don't see our needs as precious oh okay. so we think that we have to use force I, okay interesting so we've dug deep <laughs> and if people want more they can get a hold of you they can get a hold of me they can, this is not this is simple not easy yes it is a lifetime of exploring it i don't know julia how long you've been doing it but i have been studying this stuff for over 30 years and probably more um Beat me <laughs> well, it's part of it's just getting older <laughs> i don't know if i get credit for that or not but but it's actively it's like going to the relationship gym Mm -hmm. you don't go once and like i'm fixed you get on a program where you can i i work out almost every day i go mountain biking or do tai chi or do something on a daily basis i read regularly i watch um videos of marissa peer or esther perel or Brene brown or john gray or tony robbins like get on a diet yeah. or julia you can watch you get on a diet of of healthy stuff for your mind and your soul and your relationship and practice it you know yeah. read good books like read my book there is that subtle enough it's on <laughs> amazon it was a number one number one in five different categories i'm blown away because like i'm a high school dropout i dyslexic it took six months to write and six years to edit and get it, you know, where it is now. And it's an act of love. So this is a great event. Check out the other podcasts that Julia has and, and stay connected. Um, and if you want more information, you can come to argue less, love more .net, um, And watch my broadcast and sign up for a breakthrough session spend 45 minutes with me and, and because you're a friend of julia's you can come and get a complimentary breakthrough session spend 45 minutes intense you know and we get clear what's really going on is your relationship operating system set up to sabotage or support you so any closing questions julia before we bounce i I just want to say, it's, I think it's great that you mentioned practice, um, because I also had someone else on who was coming from a perspective of like grief and being present with your grief and your emotions. And he's like, you can't, you have to practice that. You can't just do it once or just show up on Super Bowl game day and have never thrown a football before and expect everything to be perfect and to win and be great. So I, I like, um, it's like a personal practice. It's very, it's very very woo woo, create your own personal practice of what do I want to create? What do I want to see? Who do I want to be? So yeah, I just thought that tied that in very nicely. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> You're welcome. And see, you said woo woo, and I look at it, it's almost the opposite. If you think about for football, yeah. it's practice is not woo woo at all. It's That's like, true. this is where you come and you learn how to play the game. Yeah. And if you don't show up at practice, you don't get to play the game. Yes. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's foundational for any athlete mm -hmm. or any musician or artist or like you know you you don't just get to show up at the Super Bowl. That was that's super grounded. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you want a remarkable relationship, you need remarkable relationship skills. I'll say that again. You want a remarkable relationship, you need relationship mark remarkable relationship skills. That's why one of my programs is love by de by design, not by default. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. That's perfect. That's what we're here about. So, I, well, I don't want to. 
love everything you're saying, Paul. I'm genuinely grateful for you for sharing that with all of us. Um, and I want to keep you forever because I, I could pump you for information for a while now. But thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for telling us about your resources. And I would encourage anyone who resonates with this to go out and look up Paul because I was blown away by that. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And um, we'll end it here. Yeah. And we'll we'll do it again. We'll talk about some of those seven skills. If you want, we can go oh. into communication because that's the foundation yeah. for having a great relationship. But most people yeah. aren't trained. We're trained how to talk, but not how to communicate. That's so. so true. I would love to, I would love to have you on again. And I would love to talk about that. Thank you so much, Paul. Have a great day. Thank you.